Islamic history at the University of Göttingen. I will kindly introduce every speaker for a minute maximum and then have a hand over uh, this, uh, the, the, the chair, the table to the uh, speaker. We'll have the talks and the questions together, uh, one after the other. So uh, we have 33, 30 minute slots. Uh, we stick to the um, envisaged time of, of 90 minutes to, to close this panel and then uh, we'll head to whatever the organizers uh, want us to. Our first speaker this morning is Hajir bin Dries, an assistant professor at the Institut Préparatoire aux Études Littéraires uh, et Sciences Humaines at the University of Tunis, Tunisia. Uh, Hajir teaches Anglophone literature, so she probably speaks French very well, but also English very well due to her studies. And her research ad addresses post-colonial and gender studies. She's president of the research group Gender Studies, affiliated to the Laboratory of Philosophy at the same university she's teaching. Uh, she's also an editor of Women, Violence and Resistance, and I take this as one of her last publications that came out last year, uh, 2017. Hedger, uh, Dr. Hedger is going to speak today on, uh, and I quote your title, of Maps and Stories, Place Telling in uh, Kamina Shamsi's Cartography. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Which one is first, the map or the story? In other words, does storytelling stem from a map, real or imaginary? Or does a story yield a map? The question may sound odd as it places us midway between literature and cartography. And yet, it is the core venture of this paper to open up venues of negotiation and dialogue between storytelling and mapping. R. L. Stevenson's anecdotal story in his essay titled My First Book, The Treasure Island, published in 1894, establishes a clear aesthetic link between the story and the map. Or is it the other way around? The map and the story. Stevenson's story, as it goes, was meant to be decisive. In the beginning, there was the map. Constrained to stay indoors because of weak health, Stevenson had to entertain a young schoolboy who had no thought for literature, but cherished instead a great predilection for watercolors. The writer ended up with the map, I quote, the map of an island, it was elaborately and beautifully colored. The shape of it took my fancy beyond expression. It contained harbors that pleased me like summits, and with the unconsciousness of the predestinate, I ticketed my performance, Treasure Island. End of quote. The map representing the skeleton of the story only needed to be converted into words. Indeed, the next thing I knew, Stevenson adds, I quote, I had some paper before me and was writing out the list of chapters. End of quote. As he perused his map, Stevenson could see characters moving and interacting, and thus was born the story. Stevenson promotes the map as the backbone of the story, a scaffold of narration, and a lever of action. And yet, Stevenson's little story of maps and stories leaves room for an alternative genesis. Even though his map, as he claims, begets the story, there must have been a shade of a story, albeit a topographical one, while drawing the contours of his island. This takes us to the far side of the map story kinship, the one that assumes that map, that map making is a progeny of storytelling. Ironically enough, Stevenson, who wrote his story up to the map, had to reconstruct his map up to the story later. The map was lost in its way along with the manuscript to be republished. He had to examine the whole book, <coughs> I quote, make an inventory of all the allusions contained in it, and with a pair of compass, painfully design a map to suit the data." End of quote. My paper builds on this specific aporia, the undecided relationship between maps and stories. Camilla Shams's cartography complicates this relationship as the narrative dramatizes a competing rapport between mapping and storytelling. More than a century later, in a short essay titled Over, Over, to, go, to Google or Not to Google, published in 2009, Camilla Shamsi provides us with a story reminiscent, albeit in a broad way, of Stevenson's. 
In her anecdote, Shamsi records the obsessive hours she spent on Google Earth following the tracks of her characters. Even though sharing with Stevenson that compulsive relationship with Max, <coughs> Shamsi brings mapping to the realm of politics. Looking for Nagasaki and Afghanistan on Google Earth, she was confronted with blurry maps compared to the detailed and bright ones uh, of New York City, for instance. Such an imbalanced cartographic production and distribution has an impact on what story to tell and whose story to hear. Like Stevenson, Shamsi concludes her essay with a celebration of the map's capacity to recuperate storytelling. I quote, Erastupinus may have tried to separate fiction from fact in the, in the world of cartography, but more than 2,000 years later, we are still using maps to describe <coughs> our stories on the world. End of quote. I provide you here with a very short synopsis of the novel uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, cartography. Set in an ethnically divided Karachi in the 1980s and 1990s, the narrative revisits the turbulent, turbulent period of the 1970s during the Bangladeshi Secession War and the subsequent partition of Pakistan. The troubled political life is juxtaposed to the lives of Rahim and Karim, whose fathers swapped fiancés back in the 70s. At the age of 13, the two friends are separated as Karim's father decides to escape the ethnical violence of Karachi and migrate to England. Rahim and Karim strive to, to keep their old friendship, but the shadow of the past infests their relationship, now that Karim knows why their parents swapped fiancés. Their tense relationship revolves mainly around Karim's decision to become a cartographer. Rahim believes that cartography cannot account of the spirit of the place. It is a cold rendition of a space. Much of the narrative is an attempt at reconciling storytelling advocated by Rahim to map making promoted by Kedim. By the end of the narrative, both reach a terrain of entente as they agree to work on an interactive map where cartography doesn't obliterate the stories of Karachi. Shamsi's deliberately misspelled the title cartography, in which the K stands for Karachi, sets the tone for the critical assessment of the narrative. The majority of essays have taken up the cartographic thematic as a pressing for chief of debate. My reading of Shamsi's cartography looks into the map story continuum. It demonstrates that maps offer a narrative model tightly linked to storytelling. My argument is twofold. First, the potential of cartographic language to express the sense of place. And second, the capacity of storytelling to configure a map. I propose to explore the poetic contours of the map that is the ancient aesthetic alliance between mapping and storytelling. I also show the conjunction between the narrative power of maps and the cartographical capacity of stories. Of course, I won't be able to do all this in details in 20 minutes. I'll do my best to be as coherent as possible. The first part of this paper, subtitled Maps and the Stories, Continua and Connections. Shamsi foregrounds in her aesthetic project modes of cartographic theory and practice. This section of the paper stems from such a conscious dialogue between mapping and storytelling. It functions as a critical and theoretical background for my, of my reading. Shamsi's narrative engages in the disciplinary hiatus instigated more than 2,000 years ago by Erastopinus of Alexandria, who promulgated the geography as a scientific discipline based on mathematics. He is said to have coined the term geographica, that he is writing the world. The word graphica designates both written and pictorial representation. And thus, geographica can signify representation in texts, in maps, or in written directions for drawing maps. And yet, in his cleansing of the field, Erastupinus dislodged writers and poets, such as Homer, claiming that the poet directs his own attention to the amusement of the mind and not at all to its instruction. A few centuries later, geographer and uh, historian Strabo launched a fierce attack on Erastopinus's scientific snobbery and proclaimed Homer the founder of geographical science and the father of geography. In the introduction to his book titled Geography, he vindicates Homer's work and aligns it to the theoretical portion of geography. Worthy of respect, he claims because, I quote, on the one hand, it embraces the arts, mathematics, and natural science, on the other, history and fable. And <coughs> The overlapping boundaries between geography and literature extended to maps and texts. 
both belong to traditions of graphic rhetoric inherited from the age of the manuscript and print culture in its early phases. In the Middle Ages, the word mappa or mappa mundi referred interchangeably to texts and maps. And after the 17th century, there was a sheer preference for geographic texts written in literary style over those using cartographic components. Robert Tully's claim that all narratives partake of the cartographic imperative finds resonance in the work of several scholars working in literary and geographical studies who have emphasized the dialogic relationship between mapping and storytelling. In an essay titled um, Maps and the Stories, A Brief Meditation, Ihab Hassan claims maps to be, I quote, our supreme fictions of the world. The narratorial capacity of maps underlines Abraham Resnick's book, Maps Tell Stories Too, whose objective is to promote an awareness about and familiarization with the language of maps. Kazati and Varsi defend a similar argument in parts and places the structure of spatial representation, wherein they ascribe a semantics to maps. This shared linguistic quality functions in a reversible way. While maps can be converted into stories, stories can also become maps. This idea is explored in Peter Turchi's Maps of the Imagination, the writer as cartographer, wherein he claims, I quote, to ask for a map is to say, tell me a story, end of quote. Franco Moretti sustains the reversible nature of maps in Atlas of the European, of the European novel. Uh, he states, a good <coughs> map is worth a thousand words, cartographers say, and they are right, it produces a thousand words, it raises doubt, ideas, end of quote. As maps function and behave like texts, they find a comfortable position in narratology. The focus on the textual quality of maps and their subtle affinity with literary production, productions has started to gain ground since the late 1980s. Geographers themselves have started rethinking maps and relocating their technologically oriented concerns into a culturally driven vision of maps and mapping. The emphasis on the technical part and the scientific precision jealously defended by the representation of cartography are debunked by a post-representational approach wherein cartography is studied within cultural contexts of production and circulation. This is how the map reader becomes as important as the map maker. Viewing maps as writing acts results in drawing on the meta-language of narrativity to deal with cartographical discourses and practices. Like texts, maps ask for readers and reading strategies and approaches. The map exudes the same narrative power yielded by a literary text and is therefore prone to deconstruction. <coughs> In an article uh, titled Deconstructing the Map, Harley draws on Foucault's theorization, to, uh, the sorry, of power, theorization of power to examine knowledge <coughs> construction in maps. He also makes use of Derrida's insights into the rhetorical quality of all texts to interrogate the interplay of center and margin in a map. Maps act, act like stories and novels. They have points of view and rely much on selection and omission. The language of literature is reassigned in cartographic criticism, thus narrowing further any gap between literary texts and maps. Dennis Wood and John Fells, for instance, largely draw on Gérard Genet's terminology in paratexts, thresholds of interpretation. Probing the questions of maps authority, circulation, and market marketability, they present their own coinage of the paramap, which they subdivide into perimap and uh, epimap. Pressing the boundaries of cartography to narratology, Dennis Wood insists on seeing a chain of stories in an atlas. He advocates a mode of reading maps inspired from Roland Barthes' model of desirous and desiring texts, which uh, he, Barthes, which Barthes elucidates in The Pleasure of the Text. Camilla Shams's narrative recuperates this dialogue between maps and the stories and provides story-like maps and map-like stories. This leads me to uh, the second part of this paper, <coughs> the subtitle Tender Maps, Carrying the Story of Kalachi. Kalim's map, the one he draws on his way to the airport, is the first map inserted into the novel. Its narratological significance <coughs> resides in its mise en abyme function. The map serves as an embedded story and shares plot elements, structural features, and themes with the main story. 
indeed, telling the story, masquerading as a map, is tightly related to the plot, uh, to the novel's plot. It is a major crisis in the narrative, announcing the geographical separation of Rahim and Karim. The drive to the airport occurs in an almost complete, complete silence. Rahim, the narrator, silently observes everybody. The driving episode represents a narrative hiatus as the flow of narration is suspended and replaced by Karim's map. On the level of narration, then, the map emerges as the storyteller. It turns out to be Kalim's graphic story of his childhood places. Comparing it <coughs> to Faiz's allergy, Caroline Herbert calls it a lyric map. I prefer to call it a tender map, and thus align it to the earliest map embedded in a novel. <coughs> in 1654, French Madeleine de Scudery, alias uh, Sappho, published Clélie Histoire Romaine. Clélie contains a map she calls Carte de Pays de Tendre, a map of the land of tenderness. It represents a topographical allegory of the different stages of a love relationship. What I take from Scuderi's map is its emotional quality, as it unfolds as a psychogeography. Shamsi, who believes Pakistan to be a great story storytelling country, declares in one of her interviews that her novels purport I quote, to create different story maps of Karachi, end of quote. Karim's hand-drawn map, which she calls intimate, maps an alternative story of his childhood city. Karim's map doesn't conform to the first eye view of a scientific map, which offers a view from above without any specific aperture or vantage point. His map behaves like a written story based on a plot with rising action, crisis, and a moment, and you can now uh, follow uh, my analysis on the copies uh, of the map. Uh, spread on one page, Karim's map story has a title, a map, underlined and placed at the top of the page. On the bottom, he places his signature, Karim 87 Karachi. Contrary to the, to the modern map, where the map maker is an anonymous figure producing a still and silent world, Karim's is a personalized and storified map, personalized through signature, storified through title. It has a beginning, start here, and an ending, effort. The story opens with the place of departure, his house, which he leaves nameless on the map, while writing between parentheses, someone else's and tomorrow. As the car moves on, he starts drawing his personalized map using the first person point of view. His mobile map shows street names, it alludes at the urban development of the city, as he remarks on the margin of his map at the beginning of his journey to the airport. All this was sea when we were kids, but now it's houses. Mapping here amalgamates personal and public spaces, memory and cartography. <coughs> the similar story map is interrupted by other sub-stories represented in the first roundabout diverging, diverging into two roads. One leading to the sea, his childhood playground, the other to a haunted palace, his childhood myths. As he progresses in his map story, which takes an ascending motion similar to the rising tension in a story plot, we reach a crisis at Kayaban i Iqbal area. In the third roundabout, Kerim inserts an arrow to point at the position of a monument called Three Swords, Tin Talwar, which he writes in Urdu letters. Kerim's, uh, so uh, here, um, the crisis, a linguistic one, is encased in two parentheses, will I forget Urdu? Kalim's fear of losing his language after his deportation to England serves as a historical nod to an ethnically divided city still fraught with linguistic schisms. As we follow Kalim in his upward movement, we reach the climax of the story at Abdullah Harem Road, indicated by Anaro, and Kalim's written text on the margin. And uh, so you see the quote there, I skip it. This arrow episode serves as a climax to the whole story map. It is at this point, both emotionally and spatially charged, that the story reaches a highest degree of tension leading to the two friends' separation. It is quite significant that this episode is placed at the highest point of the map. After Abdullah Harim wrote, the map indicates the road leading to the airport, <coughs> in rather horizontal line, imitating the following action in the graph representing a story plot. 
The airport represents the denouement of the story. Here I won't know how to say goodbye, Kelly writes. And I finish really in two minutes Wonderful. my conclusion. Great, great. Kelly's map is worth a thousand words in Moretti's phrasing. It definitely tells a story, or rather, several stories. The textual quality of his hand-drawn map offers a pertinent example of what Julia Cristina calls the spatial conception of language's poetic operation. She proposes three dimensions of the text, writing subject, addressee, and exterior texts. The dynamic relationship between these three dimensions or co coordinates operates on two axes, a horizontal axis linking writer and reader, and a vertical axis linking the given text to exterior texts and contexts. According to this interpretive model, Kalim's map, functioning as a full text on its own, horizontally links the writer or map maker and reader or map user. It unfolds as a poignant story of dislocation, as the writer or map maker is forced to leave the familiar home, here, towards an unknown there he designates as a stargate, a reference to a canny, unmapped <coughs> world. The map is a mnemonic act, an attempt at memorizing home. It also functions on a vertical axis, as its full understanding can only operate within the historical and cultural contexts of its drawing writing. The map becomes an act of storytelling, functioning as a montage of both self and place, and combining in Homi Baba's phrasing, nation and narration. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for standing so precisely to the time that was allocated okay, to you. We yeah. didn't know we, this leaves us 10 minutes for questions, so, so that's wonderful to, or comments to, to get back to the <coughs> presentation, which I found very stimulating. So I open the floor uh, to the discussion. Over there, please, at the top. Yeah. Ah, you didn't. Okay, then then let's make let let me make. No, sir. Okay. It's not really a question. I just want to say that I'm extremely grateful for this analysis. I'm so stimulated and so encouraged. I've I've known Kamila Shamsi. She visited the US actually a few years ago, uh, but I haven't been able to do, look at her work closely. But now I think that's the first thing I'm going to do. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So, so let me let me make a comment because I was also very stimulated by your uh, methodological approaches, how to equate text to maps. That I thought of a difference, of a very important difference between these two sets of, let's say, icons. Uh, texts work linear, while maps and you had very nice examples here. They work. Um, how do I say? Pluralistic. You do, you don't have a. Uh, you can't follow or you don't follow a, a, a way to read. You can pick this spot or that icon or you look to this fish or to that sea and you, you build, as a reader, you build up some, some impression of the map. So, so I think the, the maps function more, let's say, unstructured for the reader, while the text gives you a, you know, a, a, a line to follow. Otherwise, you wouldn't get the, the meaning. Well, would, would you would you agree to this? Well, in a sense, yes, but it depends on the text. Now, there are text, texts which are highly fragmented. And if you take postmodern texts, for example, texts which texts which have no aperture. Uh, this is uh, what uh, Roland Barthes calls uh, um, texts of a bliss. Those texts which uh, have no precise aperture, you can you can enter them anywhere you want. Uh, but this specific map, uh, which I call tender map, uh, I mean following uh, uh, the, the earliest map, this is quite a specific one, okay, and Shamsi um, uh, includes it to show that map making uh, can also count of uh, place, place making, because the problem here between the two uh, major characters in the narrative is that Rahim is against cartography because because map making for her is very cold, a cold rendition of space. It, it deals only with space. While Karim wants to um, control space, and, and it has its reason because all the wars in Pakistan, all 
problems of the ethnic problems, etc. So, um, so they, they, uh, though this is a way to show, in a way, okay, that maps can also show the spirit of the place and can tell stories too. You're right. This is a very linear map, but but you showed the historic maps before. If you switch back to to these uh, rivers, and you know, I was somehow uh, aesthetically appealed more than by a black and white paper text. So, so I, I think there are other notions just to add to what you said. Uh, yeah, to your, um, to your uh, methodological comments. Thank you. Nothing. Not no <laughs> critique. It's just an, an addition. Yes. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much for listening. And then we continue ahead of time. Probably there's some more. There are some more questions with the next paper. Uh, to our second speaker, who is Nikita Gloria Pinto, a MA student in English literature at the University of Delhi in India. She uh, graduated. Sorry, so she is a PhD student. Oh no. No. I'm in my final. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you graduated as a BA, as a BA student, probably from uh, Stella Maris College in Chennai, India. Um, and I was told that she won a gold medal for her BA thesis or for graduation. So, uh, yeah, congratulations to that. Mrs. Pinto has presented several papers, so she's uh, pursuing a academic career already, already uh, on post-colonial literature or speculative fiction. And her areas of interest are detective fiction, speculative fiction, and as I said, post-colonial literature. Uh, today she's speaking on the same work we just heard about, uh, i.e. Kamila Shamsi's cartography. And the title of her presentation is Mapping Migration, Identity, and Nationalism in the Set Work. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I'll be looking at uh, Camilla Shamsi's cartography, but I'll be focusing on the motive of cartography and how it relates to migration, nationalism, and even memory. So the novel is set during the turbulent era of the 20th century, and it explores the effects of historical events that shape Pakistan and the principal characters and best friends, Raheem and Karim. The title cartography itself draws attention to the differences that divide Karachi, both geographical and psychological. These differences highlight the city's trauma ridden past, which is entrenched in violence, war, and migration. The city is replete with historical circumstances of conflict and loss, from the conquest of Alexander the Great, to British colonialism, to the partition from India in 1947, to the civil war and creation of Bangladesh in 1971. Additionally, the narrator Raheem observes that conflict is ever present in the city, depicted as continually, and I quote, feasting on its own blood. The numerous instances of political, ethnic, and factional based violence that persist in the following decades, the statement is quite appropriate. The surfeit of historical strain takes on geopolitical dimensions with the motive of mapping in the novel. At a time where boundaries are constantly reassessed, physically and mentally, Mapping and storytelling are used as an attempt to collapse time and distance during a period subsumed by ethnic riots. The constant threat of exile and dislocation is intensified in a society that bases itself on fear and exclusion, creating ripples in the relationships among the characters. The novel centers on the relationship between best friends and potential lovers, Raheem and Karim, who separate because of the conflicts in Karachi, as well as the conflicts that characterize their own respective parents' histories. David Waterman, in Kamila Shamsi's uh, cartography in the itinerary of, itinerary of cultural identity, notes that, the, and I quote, the trauma of war always spills over onto the domestic map. And this is embodied in the family struggles with ethnic differences, migration, and even memory. Both sets of parents, as you can see in the diagram behind me, were initially engaged to each other but underwent a fiancé swap amid the mounting tensions during the Civil War in 1971. These actions, characterized by conflict, have repercussions on their children, who grow apart from each other when they hear of the true nature behind the fiancé swap. Raheem's father, Zafar, a muhajir, was initially engaged to Mahin of Bengali and Karim's mother during the civil war with Bangladesh. 
He becomes complicit in the atrocities of ethnic cleansing when he is confronted by a neighbor whose brother was killed in East Pakistan during the war. When he is questioned as to how he could possibly marry the enemy, Zafar, whose true motivation behind his statement is unknown, responds with, how can I marry one of them? Think of it as a civic duty. I'll be dying thing of Bengali bloodline, which ultimately results in the dissolution of the couple's engagement. With this intergenerational traumatic experience that lingers on to the present, most of the characters negotiate which stories to tell while suffering from a collective amnesia, choosing to forget and remain silent on the injustices of the past. As Zafar notes, the only thing that Pakistan has learned from its repeated and dangerous mistakes is how to forget. He writes uh, in a letter, What terrible things we must have done then to remain silent? Is it shame at losing the war? or guilt about what we did that meets us. His reflection of consensual silence alludes to the larger problem of the mainstream controlling the narrative. This enables a literal remapping of Pakistan, where certain aspects of history are calculatingly erased and even created to further ideologies of nationalism in an imagined community while painting the other as an enemy. And I quote from the novel, We act as though history can be erased. The cost of remembering. If we allow ourselves for erasure, we tell ourselves that things can be forgotten. We tell ourselves that it is possible to have acts without consequences. In calligraphy, Kamila Shamsi undertakes the task of what Caroline Herbert calls uncovering Pakistan's silenced histories. These silenced histories here refer to the genocide and repression of Bengalis, where such atrocities, as she notes, were, excised, were excised from official histories just as the parents excise and censor their past from their children. This is also the case with traditional maps that claim to present fixed truths, which are later grown to in the paper. Cartography is replete with instances of migration that go beyond the boundaries of Pakistan. The act of traveling does not just occur through distance, but also time. Locations keep shifting the novel as the characters travel from Karachi to all over the world. While this migration is often voluntary, the novel hints at two major instances of mass migration that shaped Pakistani history, both largely involuntary, the partition in 1947 and the creation of Bangladesh in 1971. Even later in 1985, James' father Ali decides that the only solution in the wake of ethnic riots is to migrate to London, fearing that history may repeat itself, endangering his Bengali wife Mahi. Leaving home because of conflict becomes a common theme in the novel and in Pakistani history. For people like Naheem, the very concept of home becomes ambiguous in a country that establishes itself as enemy territory. And she is forced to remain in exile, belonging neither here nor there. She even states that she does not wish to live Karachi as she would become a stranger among strangers. However, during the 1971 civil war, Mahin and other Bengalis in West Pakistan are constantly perceived as other. Slurs and accusations are thrown at her and her fiancé at the time Zafar, who is by association labelled a traitor and a bingo lover. These iniquities and exclusions form a part of the Pakistani existence, which is taken further in the act of cartography itself. The process of cartography, or map making, is based on excluding other elements of the story. It relies on constructing boundaries to define territories. In this manner, the nation state and dominant groups assert the hegemony by drawing literal and figurative boundaries to control the narrative and exclude the other. These ethnic conflicts arise largely in the issue of space and place. In the novel, Zafar argues that even though East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, has a larger population, they are ignored by the center. The repeated exclusion from the center results in demands for independence and subsequently civil war. Similarly, the partition between India and Pakistan mainly arose due to marginalization of the Muslim population by the center. J. Edward Mallet notes in A Land Outside Space and Expanse Without Distances, and I quote, marginalization relies on constructing and maintaining geographical margins, an often arbitrary, imaginary process that solidifies one group by shutting others out. In the novel, Zafar too notes the irony behind the formation of Pakistan, that its creation was the only way the leaders saw possible to safeguard the rights of a minority power within India. How can Pakistan still be when we have so abused that image? First by ensuring Bengalis were minimized and marginalized, and then by reacting to their demands for greater rights with acts of savagery. 
Formation that was built around this idea of inclusion and accommodation, it is largely xenophobic, often fearing the threat of new immigrants like the Bengalis and the Pathans. Ibn Yasmin acknowledges the paradox of the creation of the Mahajit homeland. We left India in 1947. We left our homes saying that we cannot live amid this injustice. And then we came to a new homeland and became a willing part of a system that perpetuated marginalization and intolerance of the Bengalis. Manet observes that maps fostered the creation of myths that would assist in the maintenance of the territorial status quo. Maps strengthened the notion of the nation as an imagined community, as nationalism relies on the imposition and strengthening of borders. Borders are crucial to the formation of national identities, to distinguish us from them. However, the act of migration subverts the concept of a permanent, permanent territorial identity and even leads to a fluid national identity. As a result, tensions mount between various ethnic groups in the novel who feel threatened by this change. Laila, for example, who belongs to the feudal Sindhi elite, asserts, Karachi is my home, you know. Why did those bloody Mohajis have to go and form a political group? Like they did, thinking that they can, uh, thinking that just because they are majority in Karachi, they can trample over everyone else. My family lived there for generations. Who the hell are these Mohajis to pretend it's their city? The Mahajis are constantly labeled as immigrants, as strangers and outsiders who did not belong to Karachi despite having occupied the city for generations. Asif, Laila's husband, uh, also remarks that Mahajis will never understand the way we feel about land. They all left their homes at partition, no understanding of ties to a place. Asif and Laila reflect the Sindhi perception of themselves as natives strongly bound to their land, where their notion of home is dependent on perceiving the Mahajis as the other, as outsiders. Shamsi therefore problematizes the very. Uh, I didn't, didn't do anything. Please, please go. Please go. Uh, Shamsi therefore problematizes the very notion of being at home in Pakistan. And this hostility is not just reserved for the Bengali population, but also the Muhajis. Therefore, territory is important to the nativist narrative as it facilitates the positioning of Muhajis as outsiders. A term Zafar resents because of its connotation as immigrant. Zafar asserts that, and I quote, Mahajis came here leaving everything behind, our homes, our families, our ways of life. However, as Priya Kumar observes in Mahajis as a diaspora and in Tizar Hussein, the sea lies ahead in Kamila Shamsi's cartography. The Mahaji diaspora is not so much about retaining ties to the ancestral land as it is about preserving the memory of migration. In their memorialization of their migrant past, displacement comes to shape their very sense of self. This sense of exile is also experienced by their children too. Pakistan is portrayed as a nation subsumed in conflict, and this conflict continues even in the 1980s, forcing Kareem's family to migrate to London. Kareem feels displaced and says, I've already started thinking of Karachi as a place I have to say goodbye to. This must be what dying is like. His anxieties about exile from Karachi are intensified later when he realizes the significance of 1971 to his family's disintegration and invariably his separation from Rahim. Karim tells Rahim that he is trying to come to grips with Karachi's nature, which according to him can be properly materialized to the act to the art of calligraphy. As Malik argues, and I quote, unless the politics fueling and fueled by cartography are understood, unless Karachi's citizens comprehend the destructive potential of a place, the city will continue to struggle with violence. End quote. For Karim, maps act as a way for him to rationalize everything around him, to bring order to the violent chaos of Karachi. In his moments of distress, he turns to cartography so as to map out his emotions. Karim, on the way to uh, on the way to the airport, plots out street signs and the route to the airport from home in his notebook. When he leaves for London, as a way of remembering Karachi, this hand-drawn map of Karim's in 1987 is permeated with memories and anxieties of leaving home. At the point marked home in the map, he notes that it will be occupied by someone else uh, by tomorrow, signifying the temporality and transient nature of places. Similarly, Rahim, after hearing about the true nature of events surrounding her parents' fiancé swap, leaves her home in a state of shock, driving as far away as she can get, while remembering specific locations to console herself. Locations are of significance in the novel, especially when embedded in memory. Also, in his construction of the map, Kareem wonders whether he will forget Urdu. Language, too, is tied to the concept of home. However, in 
Kareem in 1987, ignores the Bengali aspect of his identity. He does not seem to question whether he will forget the Bengali part of his heritage. As Caroline Herbert observes, Bangladesh is, and I quote, an absent presence in contemporary Pakistan's material and imaginative space, end quote. Moreover, there are various instances in the novel where Rahim herself alludes to their sameness, to their inseparable and conjoined identities. It can be argued that Rahim attempts to establish that there are no differences between them in spite of their diverse respective heritages, therefore making them equal in the face of the nation-state's predispos predisposition of creating the other. Alternately, it can be argued that Rahim is ignoring his difference, just as the nation-state has ignored the laws of Bangladesh. Her desire for sameness reflects the state's ideology of suppressing difference for national sameness. As Waterman notes, and I quote, the politics of location always seems to result in the recording of a partial identity, where the immigrant is seen as a somewhat impure Pakistani, certainly not a Sindhi, a not quite Karachiite. Both Rahim and Karim have differing attitudes with respect to maps. Karim is preoccupied with facts and official names of places that need to be charted on maps. However, for Rahim, memories and stories cannot be ignored or erased in the geographical composition of a place as they help hear the heartbeat of the place. She labels Karim as a foreign cartographer who substitutes lived experience for clinical facts and names. As she writes in her polished paper, but if you leave Zytro and forget its magic, you will start listening to the poison of those who all say streets must have names. You will join in the task of making directions easy for foreign travelers. And, by, and one by one, as you ink in your map, they disappear. The fruit seller, the ghosts, the friends you never said goodbye to. However, she assumes an intimacy with the city that alienates Karim. Here she mistakes intimacy for exclusion, and I quote, that map, that map marks you as an expat and not a Karachiite. People here don't talk in street names, end quote. Through the act of mapping, through the act of mapping, Karim illustrates how limited Rahim's life is in the context of Karachi's identity politics. This prompts her to acknowledge that her privilege facilitated her blinkered worldview as it allowed for the erasure of day-to-day -day struggles of ethnic politics. Karim's internet map in 1995 allows for an inclusive space for proposing Karachi's multiple stories, often relegated to the margins in mainstream narratives. The map, according to him, would highlight the city's social linguistic diversity while creating a space for inclusivity and belonging, as it would include, and I quote, sound files of Karachiites telling stories in different languages with graphics for people who are illiterate, end quote. These internet maps are not only symbolic of progress, but they also allow for the negation of alienation and exile felt by Karachiites themselves. Mapping Karachi, therefore, allows for reconciliation, as Malin notes, the internet map allows for space, memory, community, and healing together." End quote. Kareem's obsession with maps gives him a nuanced understanding of the past and its traumas. While initially creating boundaries between them, maps unite Rahim and Kareem as they decide to work together on the interactive internet map, thereby bringing order to the disorder of, the Kara of Karachi's traumatic past while creating a space for reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Again, also thanks for staying within the time frame that was set. Are there uh, comments <coughs> or questions from the speaker? Do I take this? No. Um, so, so let me let me come forward with one uh, question mm -hmm. or one comment. You you seem very fascinated of this book, uh, mm -hmm. which you analyzed, which you analyzed in depth. Um, me as someone who's not very familiar with uh, Pakistani, Indian, or Bangladeshi history, can you can you tell me a few words? What's what makes this book so precious or so worth for for a deep scientific analysis? Uh, you mean in terms of history? Uh, I think it's uh, what is fascinating you? Uh, what fascinates me yeah. about the novel? Yeah. Uh, actually, the novel. I was more drawn to the writing, the way she's written okay. it. It's uh, beautifully written. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and she talks about, I mean, at least as an Indian, we don't really, we're not that familiar with other South Asian uh, countries, their histories. So this novel happened to be in one of our South Asian papers. So, I mean, I was drawn to it because, I mean, this was offering a completely different perspective.
from at least uh, Indians aren't really familiar with Pakistani history at all. Mm -hmm. So this definitely. You want to add something? Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, you. I, I really, in a way, I wonder. Uh, I mean, having read uh, Camilla Shamsi's the other side of the story, because she speaks about uh, partition, uh, second partition, uh, this one partition of Pakistan, but India also was involved. Yeah. So, but you have, you as an Indian, your own story of this. Do they concord in a way? Are they the same? Uh, not exactly as usual, of course, because these two countries were sort of enemies at the point, at that point. So the India would have its own perspective on partition. Uh, it would probably be blaming Pakistan for the separation. Um, in terms of, uh, you mean like the different perspectives from India's point of view? <coughs> yes, yes. Um, and for you, I mean, for you, I mean, what, what did it add um, to you as an Indian? Not really, because my generation isn't that, I mean, affected, at least, at least if I look at my peers, this is not something that we talk about at all. So I don't think even my parents' generation was affected, maybe grandparents. Mm -hmm. So this is something that isn't spoken about, but the feelings of enmity are still there somehow uh, between these two countries, even though it has nothing to do with uh, some of us in the present. It's still there. Like You can even see it in, in something like cricket matches. You can see the sort of enmity that still exists between Sorry. Again, I mean, uh, what, what I find really fascinating that you are telling me that your generation doesn't give a damn about mm -hmm. partition, about all these things, and yet, uh, how can you, I mean, how can you explain this obsession with this specific topic in South Asian literature? On the both sides, I mean, with Pakistan, in Pakistani literature and in Indian literature, this trauma of partition is there yeah. uh, for for many yes. years now, and still now, they are still not talking about. So also there's the fact that, um, so the partition, I think, uh, at least from what I know, it did not affect South India that much. So um, most of the regions in North India, like I know of people whose ancestors were directly affected by the event. So that sort of has more um, traumatic impact on their memories as such and how they pass it on to their generations. <coughs> But uh, certain parts of India were sort of cut off from all of, uh, of whatever was happening during that time. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's only of late that people are sort of revisiting the past and sort of, uh, sort of uncovering those histories and what they actually meant and sort of looking at it from an objective perspective. Because at that time, things were pretty uh, subjective. We have another, yeah, we have one question here, then uh, there, and then there. Yes, there's a small comment that we we'll take another question. It's again related to the presentation by the both speakers on that particular issue. The list now, that is our problem that what is known as the past, is the that we present, that never appears mm -hmm. us in our peak presentation. So we have to live the past mm -hmm. with all of its negativities and positivities. As regards the particularity of Significantly about the post independence drama that was unfolded in the context of the Indian part, in the people part of the continent. My little comment or question would be that in what extent, or in terms of the size, this actual cartography that has been produced over the years, size is related to the whole of the, to the meta narrative that we have in regards to that drama that was unfolded. Oh, so you're asking uh, to what extent does the novel? Yeah. Sorry, you're asking whether the novel uh, deals with uh, the partition and the consequences of that. Like to what extent? The actual representation of uh, of uh, the drama. Yeah. It. Is um, it narrative or meta narrative or finances? It uh, it does actually. Uh, even though the narrative is quite fictional. Uh, there were possibilities. I mean, you could say that. There, I mean, there were possibilities of uh, people from two nations, like say Bangladesh and Pakistan, who were together but had to separate. Uh, there was so. I mean, I think you might be familiar with Pakistan. There were so many cases of that happening. So even though this account is fictional, she does draw from uh, facts. It is pretty much grounded. I mean, it is a little romanticized in the novel uh, because 
but there is also a romance at the heart of it. Uh, but yeah, it is pretty much, uh, there is a lot of, uh, she has drawn a lot from history. So, I'm not sure. Still, there is still room for uh, you know, taxi management. Yeah, there, there, yeah. Is there is, because uh, I've been reading somewhere that uh, one of the critics had a problem with uh, her novel that she sort of ignored the. Uh, so the thing is, uh, Pakistan's uh, violent history, I mean, it's still ongoing, and the idea of immigration, it's still ongoing. So um, I think uh, the Afghan refugees were not really focused in the novel, like they were mentioned. So there is room for sort of exploring that aspect, because uh, well, the Bengali uh, aspect and the Muhajir aspect was pretty much explored in the novel, but this was something that was sort of, not exactly ignored, it was mentioned, but this is also something that has been happening of late, so there's room for that. And the dean raised his hand, yes, please. I'm the dean. I'm, I'm not the dean. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, then I mistook you, but please, it's your, it's your uh, time anyway, yeah. Um, I have a very basic question, I realize this might be, um, uh, I, I just want a very brief answer, because it could be an extensive answer as well. Um, I was very, Uh, well, Midnight's Children was or narrates this uh, split minute. I mean, midnight when uh, India was uh, and Pakistan and were separated. And I believe that Salman Rushdie uh, started in a way, I mean, to globalize this question of partition and. Uh, Mohammed here, who believes that writers, and um, I think Professor Mohammed, uh, I'm talking about, I mean, because of his question, he believes that uh, writers are magnifying this this question of partition. Now it is a trauma, it is a real trauma, and many writers are talking about it. Uh, they don't take things from the same perspective, but the um, the pain of trauma. Is there? Samia Rushdie dramatizes other parts of it. Uh, Camilla Shamsi is, uh, is very young and uh, she speaks about the. It's not the same partition, by the way. Okay? Camilla Shamsi, Shamsi speaks about the partition of Pakistan and Bangladesh, then in the 73. Uh, Samia Rushdie speaks about the first partition. But uh, the trauma of partition is there, the pain of partition, the violence. Is there. And I believe that this is what they need to revisit, uh, to, 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 to heal through words, through fiction. I believe this is why it is ongoing till now. Thank you. We have three more questions, and with that, I would close the, the speakers list. One, one, two, three. No, over there. Okay. The, the gentleman over there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you for this presentation. Uh, one of the part mentions that patients with Arab, which are Muhajir, uh, becomes become uh, uh, based of the <coughs> based of the, the ruins, right? So I, I just want you to elaborate on that. On the term Mohajis? Yes. Uh, they, they be, now they become based on what? Uh, so yeah, the Mohajis originally referred to at least in terms of partition history, they would refer to the people who migrated from mostly northern provinces of India to Pakistan, so newly formed Pakistan. Uh, so they were called uh, immigrants. I think the term roughly translates uh, in English as uh, immigrant. So yeah, they still, I think they still are called. I mean, so one of the points of contestation is the term Muhajiras and why should they still be called immigrant even if they've been living there for more than 50 years. So there is that sense of hostility that they experience because they are still looked as outsiders who weren't originally uh, in Pakistan. They migrated uh, from India, like from the northern parts of India. Um, can I ask you to go back one slide before? Okay. Yeah, uh, 
Bengali, yeah, the Bengali people from Bangladesh. They are different. Okay, yes. Uh, Muslims were right in North India. This is yeah. Muhammad. So Muhammad is where people are originated in North India. This is what yeah, I mean, I don't think the term ex exactly existed before their migration. So after they migrated to Pakistan, at least that's the way the novel presents it, after they migrated, they were sort of uh, labeled as immigrant, as Muhajir. How does, for example, either history books or national museums perhaps in India or Pakistan approach this particular topic? Is it still something that is, is it not mentioned? Is it mentioned? Is it similar to what she has written? It's, uh, yeah, so. Does it give that perspective mm -hmm. it, uh, We definitely had a perspective of it, uh, but an Indian perspective. Okay. We weren't. Uh, in fact, uh, Pakistan's separation from Bangladesh wasn't uh, talked about that much. In fact, uh, I think the Indian Army forces sort of uh, intervened, and I think there was a war, there was a conflict between Pakistan and India over Bangladesh about Bangladesh success, uh, succession. So again, the Indian Army would have been painted as heroes for you know liberating Bangladesh from Pakistan, and that's pretty much the narrative we've been given uh, in books. In books, yeah. So. We did study about it in history. Partition is definitely uh, British colonialism and partition, these two events are directly related. Uh, and yeah, it is talked about, but uh, Pakistan's side is ignored. Yeah. Their aspect, um, all of that is ignored. Uh, but however, I think when you study in literature, you sort of tend to, like, even if you're studying in, in, in an Indian university, you can, I mean, you don't really stick with one perspective. At least that's how. Most of us learned that okay, there was another perspective to the story. So yeah, again, most of us were not even aware of at least my generation wasn't even aware of the uh, separation from of Bangladesh and Pakistan and how traumatizing it was. Yeah, I think that's just such a mm -hmm. shame, and I feel that it is essential to exactly. for for healing. You have healing. to acknowledge what happened, yeah. and you have to find a way to open that discourse and make it for people to learn about it in yeah. different ways. And okay, yeah, because it's not spoken about. This is something. I think most of us not in the the novels that you're talking about, the general mm -hmm. language there are extremely yeah. so that's another thing. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, just getting back to the Muhajir Muhajir issue, and I think this is what Struck, struck you struck you odd it's a highly a religious term yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and the, the the English term immigrant doesn't doesn't capture this yeah. religious meaning of going from an abode of not being liked to an abode mm -hmm. where you can freely uh, yeah, uh, pursue your religion. So I, I think this connotation is yeah. is very important to, for those people who, who move mm -hmm. to Pakistan, um, yeah, which it cannot be grasped by by immigrants. Yes, but in the novel itself, I think uh, some of the characters themselves are, are proud of the term Haji because of the connotation with Prophet Muhammad and yes, uh, their migration. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but that term sort of becomes a negative term, and they're constantly. It's used as a term of labeling someone, so to present them as an outsider. So then it becomes a term of contestation. Yeah. So final question or comment right. over there. Thank you. Um, thanks for your talk. I want to return to mapping um, for a second. <coughs> this relates, I'm sure, and I'm looking forward to the last talk too. It might relate. Um, the the idea, right? The partition. Partition is a spatial term, right? I mean, it's it's, it's dividing by maps and colonization is all about drawing abstract lines on maps that right that, that, that simplify and create violence. That, that simple line sure. um, Do you, and here in both talks, talking about the novel, the, especially that, that last scene um, with, or not the last scene, the last mapping you talked about with the internet mapping and the idea of using a map to identify complexities in language or anything else, it seems very aligned with you know, a recent turn in deep mapping, right, as a, as a, as a method to reform maps as a way to acknowledge culture, um, experience, psychogeographies, right, and building them that way. Do you see the novel then as trying to rehabilitate the potential for mapping as a non-violent thing, right, as a non-abstracting mode, um, and rather 
return it, right? Give it some potential to acknowledge um, complexity, right? To acknowledge stories. If that's so, can those maps exist outside of the novel itself? Right? Is, is the narrative necessary to make meaning to those maps? Right? Can a map ever do the thing, a deep map, right? Can it do the things that it wants to do without the full narrative associated with it? <coughs> Um, not the the narrative. Is, the narrative is about mapping and, and the title itself, cartography, with uh, with a K. But she explains, I mean, the narrator explains the use of the K um, in the narrative. And Camilla Shamsi uh, is very much um, or, or write, wrote her, her her novel in a highly cautious way. And she did a lot of research, and she read many, many books about mapping. Uh, and uh, uh, her project is definitely to to see this question of mapping and map making actually, and to probe the idea of uh, place and space. This is this is one of of, of the points she wants to. Uh, to explain in her uh, narrative. And she makes a real difference between uh, this cold way of mapping, uh, like uh, I mean, any cartography would do, and uh, cartography which um, recuperates the spirit of the place. And the, the, the final, and the book ends with a type of a new cartography. This is uh, interactive cartography, uh, a map uh, on the internet. Uh, which uh, then uh, mixes <coughs> mapping and storytelling. Uh, so, part of the question, I mean, uh, what is the, the role of mapping here? Or... Sorry. I, I, I think it quite captured what, what she wanted to know, and we have to continue to the next uh, okay. presentation. If, you, if you're fine that we make a full stop at this, at this point, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks for this intense discussion. We turn to our third. Speaker, yes, please. Uh, Soledad Morandeira de Paz, a Spanish scholar, a scholar uh, and a PhD student at the moment <coughs> in Spain at the uh, Universitat de Valladolid. Uh, Soledad is working on Mapa Mundi, Alter Mundus representations of the world in the medieval, in the Middle Ages. So she's turn, we're turning our focus from literature on maps uh, over literature about maps to maps themselves. Uh, Soledad got her master degree from the same university, but her bachelor degree from uh, a university in Rio de Janeiro, which I haven't known, but uh, yeah, sounded quite interesting to me to go to Brazil for studying a BA. Uh, Soledad is speaking today, as I said, on, on mapping. Her, the title is Faith Mapping, Iconography of Beliefs in Medieval Cartography. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for your nice award. Um, I want to congratulate my brilliant uh, colleagues, um, uh, Harold and Dries and Nikita Pinto. I am agree with with the two of them because uh, map acts uh, as a novel, as a story, and map is uh, a storyteller. And medieval maps as all the maps do much more than show the uh, physical details of the world. They offer a perspective on how societies view themselves and how the others were understood. <coughs> uh, the intention of this paper is to present the multiple levels that make medieval map a movie, a complex artifact of great significance to the study of cultural events in the Middle Ages. Uh, Christianity and Islamism are two paradigms not only at a religious and moral level, but also at the scientific one. Concerning the origins of the world and its representation, men no longer explains the earth based on reason and experience, but as a believer, he feels drawn to following the guidance indicated by the holy text. Sometimes investigations gives way to fantasy and cartography changes into a wealth of symbols not easy to interpret. Christianity breaks off with classical traditions, and as we can see on the OT or this terrarium maps, 
at the Beatos maps. Uh, also, there is a phase of absolute simplification. And in the nautically based charts, call it Portolani. Um, on the other hand, Islamism showed a Greek influence from the beginning, whose people, science, culture, and libraries now falling, uh, falling under the domain of the former. We would like to focus on the Catalan atlas uh, from, uh, and the nautical cards from the Mallorca School of Cartography in order to show through the analysis of its image how the different religions were understood in the, in the West. On these maps, there is a space uh, allocated for Christianity, Islam, and even the Indian religions. It is important to remark the fact that most of the Mallorcan school cartographers were Jewish converted to Christianity. So as we can see on maps, the personal experiences of the cartographers seem also revealing. Um, we have uh, here some uh, examples from uh, philately, a very interesting, interesting work. I'm very keen on this art. And we have um, a stamp, a catch stamp uh, from a Sephardic uh, philately. The other one is from Senegal and the other from Spain. They have also uh, in common uh, the Catalan Atlas for Mallorca School of Cartographers. Um, uh, here we have uh, some uh, marvelous maps from Muslim civilization. The world appears from our point of view upside down, a time when north was south and south was north, the was Mecca. Mecca was the umbiculus mundi, the axis mundi, the, the center of the world. We tend to take many things for granted. Today we have such freedom to travel around the world, so much so that we, can, we tend to travel far and wide without ever considering the immense contributions others have made for our convenience. <coughs> Great scholars from Muslim civilization indeed turned the world upside down with their maps, not just metaphorically, but world maps were literally upside down, with South depicted at the top. And we have uh, some examples uh, from al Istahri uh, from 10th century, even Haukal, uh, 16th century, al uh, 9th century, and uh, Kashgar, uh, sorry for my my pronunciation from 11th uh, century. They, uh, they are uh, all, all are, uh, are uh, maps with a uh, south on top. Um, we have here a brilliant uh, sample uh, from a cartographer Al Idrisi from the 12th century. He was born in Ceuta. Uh, studied uh, at Cordoba in Spain and he works uh, for the Norman court uh, of Palermo. Even, uh, well, she, uh, he uh, traveled around uh, Morocco, France, Spain, and even visited uh, England. Uh, his description of uh, Western Europe is quite accurate and lively. The, uh, here we have a, a um, it's a map, but it is, it is also a diagram uh, more simple. But uh, we can see the south on, on top, the, the center, the axis mundi is uh, Mecca. Um, uh, we are more accustomed to see the maps like this. So this is how is placed uh, La Mecca. Another one is, is another interpretation from our point of view. It may come on the center of the world. And we can see it's very accurate uh, for that time. But uh, he also has uh, uh, this, this wonderful uh, map, um, the treatment of the Balkans as for the rest of Europe and um, for most of the Islamic world. 
um, based on the breakings of others, uh, he, he used the system of cylindrical projection of the Earth's surface, called it uh, in the 15th century Mercator projection, uh, the Flemish uh, Gerard Mercator. We have another example uh, of a map uh, with the south places uh, in the north. Um, it's the uh, chart Borgia from the uh, 15th uh, century. It's anonymous and it's in the Vatican uh, Library. Um, the other one is um, the Mapa Mundi of Fra Mauro, 15th century. Um, in the Biblioteca Nazionale Marciana, the Venice. South is on top. Um, I, I would like to focus on uh, Saint Isidore from Sevilla, uh, etymologies uh, from the six, uh, 6th uh, century. Uh, in the, um, they are examples of uh, oriented maps because uh, Orient is uh, on top, because it's, it's east, and uh, the, the sun rises um, in, in Orient. Uh, I, I know uh, Orient uh, nowadays is, uh, is not very um, correct uh, word for politically, but uh, at, at the ancient times, uh, Romans, uh, they said a phrase, uh, ex oriente lux, uh, the light comes from orient, from east. Um, and uh, nowadays uh, we have the expression oriented maps, I, I am oriented, I am disoriented, and so on. Um, this one, uh, mm -hmm. ah, it's, it's a very uh, interesting um, representation uh, because um, there are uh, three um, parts of the world um, adjusted uh, to the um, writings of the Greeks and Romans, but also the, the, the holy test. Um, because uh, after the deluge, the, the, the great flood, um, Noah um, made a little repartition uh, of the of the parts of the world uh, between his uh, the three sons, Sem, Cam, and Japheth. Uh, Japheth uh, has Europe, Cam Africa, and Sem Asia. And until today, we 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 call it the Semitic uh, languages to the languages from Asia. Uh, it is called Orbis Terrarum OT uh, map because of the O is the, <coughs> is the sea, the Oceanus, and the T uh, is the Medit Mediterranean um, sea, and um, a, college, in, a collage, a collage, a kind of collage uh, between the River Nile, uh, Sea of Azov, and uh, other uh, sea ma masses. Uh, we have here the, uh, one example from the Beatus of Burgo de Osma. Beatus are, um, are very special books, um, uh, also called a commentary on the Apocalypse of uh, St. John. Uh, it's uh, from the 10th century. Uh, this uh, type of book also contains, uh, always contains a uh, Mapa Mundi. And the other one was uh, is the Westminster uh, Psalter in the British Library uh, from the 12th uh, century. Uh, they are a, a, a type of encyclopedia. The, the other one is another example of Isidorian map from the uh, 12th century. Um, it's very tiny, uh, 20 centimeters. Uh, it's anonymous and it's uh, in Munich, in the Bayerisch uh, Stats uh, Bibliothek. And the, the other one is the um, Hereford map, 
uh, from the uh, 13th uh, century uh, to uh, two me uh, meters per two meters. Uh, another encycl encyclopedia uh, from the world. I, all they uh, are oriented with east on top. And uh, we have uh, here an example of, of Porto Portolano. Um, it's a chart or card of um, Angelino Dulcer from the uh, 13th century and shows, uh, for example, the hash or the pilgrimage to Mecca. There are uh, some details as the uh, Red Sea painted on red and a small, a tiny little path uh, where the, the people of Israel, uh, uh, they cross it uh, by uh, when, when, when Moses uh, opens the, the waters. We have also Mount uh, Sinai, where Moses received the tablets of uh, the Covenant, the city of Jerusalem, and the Holy Sepulchre. Also the Hajj, or Muslim pilgrimage, and the worship of the idol of metal with nine heads and nine hands in uh, the lands of India. Uh, and uh, the, the details, uh, uh, the Red Sea, painted uh, in red. The uh, Rende Saba, the, uh, the Queen of Saba. <coughs> um, Mansa Musa, or Rex Meli, the King of Mali. And his, uh, here is uh, Mecca, uh, the city of Mecca. Um, Here, uh, the Abraham and Yafuda Cresques from uh, the 14th century. Um, King Juan uh, I of Aragon gave this precious atlas as a gift, of, as a present to his cousin, uh, Carlos IV of France. Uh, the, um, is a pergamine, a six a vellum fixed of their wood. Um, and Abraham and Yafuda uh, were Jewish converted to Christianity. Uh, we have here some details. Uh, for example, uh, the, the crescent uh, half moon uh, uh, to, in order to identify uh, some cities, or for example, like this, or Granada with a banner with Arabic. Uh, Characters. Um, we have also uh, we have Christian cities, uh, Hebraic cities. Um, the, um, here with the with the David Star. And uh, mis a kind of misunderstood because they represent a, um, a prayer. A, um, in a in a move uh, that is is very close to how Christians uh, pray, but these kind of mistakes uh, between the Christian and uh, Hebraic people is is very common. And in the other uh, image, we we have Mansa Musa, the richest man in the in the in the world history. Uh, it was called the King of Kings. It was the emperor of the great empire of Mali uh, in the uh, 13th century. The lion of Mali, uh, he took the empire of Mali to his peak. And why his popularity? Because uh, he made his pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324 with a procession of 60,000 uh, men, uh, 12,000 uh, servants, who each carried four pounds of gold bars, heralds uh, dressed in silks, who bore gold staffs, organized horses, and had handled bags. He gave away gold to the poor along his route, gave gold to all the cities he passed, he passed by on his way to Mecca, including Cairo and Medina. He built a new mosque every Friday in any city. 
he passed, he passes by. Yeah, and it was documented by several uh, I um it's, it was, Writers, writers, um, along the route. But this generosity, however, devastated the economy of the region. The sudden influx of gold devaluated the metal for decades. Prices on goods and wares richly inf uh, inflated. The only time recorded in history that one single man, man directly controlled the price of gold in Mediterranean. Another Portolani, and also the same things, the uh, Mansa, Mansa Musa here with a, with a coin of, of gold. Here. Uh, uh, the Queen of Saba, other sovereigns and, and kings. Um, uh, this is a Mesia of Villa Destes, or one, uh, another cartographer cartographer from Mallorcan uh, uh, School. Uh, another one. And uh, uh, always the same mistake, representing a uh, Sabazon uh, praying uh, towards uh, Mecca in a Christian way of praying. And uh, in a uh, Masa Musa in the <coughs> other uh, this one is, is the same mistake uh, from the Borgia map uh, with a city of Mecca and, and the, the moves of these two people uh, is, is Christian, not Muslim. And in the other scenes we have um, a one, a one illustration from the, um, the travels of Marco Polo in the 13th century. Uh, the, the, the Book of Wonders, and uh, it is said that uh, this one, the uh, above, is from uh, Atlas Catalan, uh, Atlas Catalan uh, from the Mallorcan School of Cartographers, and the other one uh, from uh, Marvel's book of uh, Marco Polo. And it is said that um, the, the incineration, about the incineration of corpses in, in Asia, uh, and it is said on uh, Marco Polo's book, on the province of Camul, the people are all idolaters and have a peculiar language. They are a people who take things very easily, for they mind nothing but playing and singing and dancing and enjoying themselves uh, when they when they fire uh, the corpse of the of the dead people, as we can see in the two images. Um, this one uh, in the center is from uh, Messia de Villadestes uh, Portolani, <coughs> the worshipping of the idol of metal with nine heads and nine hands. But the representation is very simple and is, um, it's very similar to Beatus' illustrations, uh, Illuminuras, uh, from the dream of Nabucodonosor, of the idol. We have here um, another another legend um, uh, from uh, Atlas Catalan. Uh, we have uh, the great ser prince of Gog and Magog, which appears in the times of Antichrist with a lot of people. Uh, and the, the other is a picture from the Uffizi Gallery, the adoration of the Meiji, of the magicians, by Lorenzo di Monaco. And uh, the, uh, it, it, it is representing uh, the three wise men uh, with many people uh, that uh, are dressed and look it like, uh, like the people uh, following the Antichrist with a, a banner with a, a scorpion as a symbol of the devil. Um, another another um, part of the Atlas uh, Catalan uh, with the domains of the Antichrist and uh, it represents um, uh, the biblical characters of Gog and Magog because they have a very important place in the cartography of the Middle Ages. 
not only did these characters exist as reality as realities in the medieval mind, because they, they also constituted a dull and ever present threat to safety and welfare of, of the Christian world. According to Aeticus of Istria, a narrator of great tales, Gog and Magog, and 22 nations of evil men were driven by Alexander the Great back to the very shores of the northern Austria. They, they, there they were imprisoned on a peninsula behind the Caspian gates and a wall of iron erected with divine aid by Alexander. And we have the wall uh, as a kind of mountain. And this one is a very modern uh, uh, map. It's the first that represents uh, America. It's the uh, chart or cart, carta of Juan de la Cosa. Um, uh, he uh, traveled uh, with Christopher Columbus in the second travel. Uh, and it's very modern and it's a Portolani also, but uh, he also represents uh, things as in the middle in the Middle Ages, as the Red Sea painted on on red, the three uh, three white, uh, wise men uh, riding riding an, uh, a horse coming from Orient, and also the people of Gog and Magog in northern uh, Siberia. It's uh, another detail. And they, uh, they are represented as uh, kinocephalus, uh, uh, people with um, a dog uh, header. And the other one is uh, Blemia, uh, who is also an anthropophagus, a cannibal, and is eating, eating here. <laughs> and for finish, uh, uh, we, we finish with, with Ali Drisi because it's a kind of map, very uh, um, geographic, but uh, he also contains the wall uh, that er erected by Alexander the Great uh, for divide uh, the people uh, from Gog and Magog. It's the only concession to fantasy in this map. And I, will, I would like to finish with, with a quote from Hakim Sanai from Afghanistan in the, uh, the 11th century, uh, and he says, at his door, what is the difference between Muslim and Christian, virtuous and guilty? At his door, all, all we are seekers, and he, the soul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Soledad, for showing us this one, these wonderful maps and uh, particularly focus on the representation of Mecca on, on some of them, on most of them. Um, please let me start with one comment. What you said is we, we are speaking about symbols, right? We are speaking about blue lines that we interpret as lakes or as rivers or whatever. So if a map designer wants to symbolize praying for his medieval European Latin audience, I guess he has to use the imagery the audience will understand. If he, if he draws a Muslim prey, i.e. bent with 90 degree angle, for example, mm -hmm. the reader wouldn't understand the gesture. So he draws the, the Muslim praying in Mecca like a Christian prayer the, the reader knows. And I guess it's, you can call it wrong, factually wrong, but it is, is uh, due to the, to the recipient and to the symbol Symbol, symbolized language of the whole matter we have here, J just as a comment to so what you said. Thank you, thank you very much. Are there further questions or comments? Yes, one, two, three. Okay. Please go, please start, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. I was just reminded of, I mean, I agree with you when you said that the map is the only thing I use to, to trigger storytelling, because we have all the <coughs>
it came to hate and narratives, and you can almost grasp them, and you can almost feel them in the map that you traveled, you know, during it. Well, I was wondering, is there anything comparable to this handout that we had, like figures repeatedly showing up, events being connected to other events through, I don't know, ethnographic signs? Is there any, something like a plot that is developed throughout these maps or in some specific map? I think uh, um, uh, medieval maps, uh, especially uh, on uh, the uh, Christian law, um, uh, they work with the uh, authorities, uh, with the heritage uh, from, from the ancient times, uh, uh, Greeks, Roman, uh, persons like uh, Herodotus or Strabo, or even uh, as um, uh, Plinius the Orf, and, and so on, and, the, and, and they uh, pick up uh, all, all that uh, uh, heritage. And, the, and also they, they, they make a kind of a collage uh, with the um, uh, storytelling from, from travelers. Marco Polo, eh, Jean de Piancartin, eh, Jean de Mandeville, for example, and, um, and they represent eh, eh, that information to the maps. But eh, coexists coexist, eh, everything there. And obviously the, the, the peripherics, the boundaries, eh, there are eh, places for, for fantasy, for fabulous races, for monsters, dragons, and things like that. But it's an uh, a, amalgamate in, in a kind of way, see, in a way of speaking. But uh, it, it's very, very different in, in, the, in the Muslim uh, maps. Thank you. Well, uh, that's a very simple question that might be interesting. <coughs> when we are dealing with the cartography and the historical information related to the pre historical times, we actually engage with what is, which could be classified as uh, beyond history. The things which have been beyond history, we are incorporating in our consciousness of the present. I think that poses a big challenge for the sciences, or even for the social sciences. Because when we are trying something that was that is other in the deep past in which nothing was available. We are simply trying our own stages of imagination. The, 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 the minus points of that sort of exercise is that we are incorporating this inaccuracy into things which are to be defined as accurate. So we have to have a clear limit of what is scientific way and what is unscientific way. Mm -hmm. Means, uh, what is uh, mythological or might seem to be mythological cannot be intertwined with what is to be categorized as purely historical. So this is the basic question, and this question might uh, have relevance uh, in all the cartographic exercises <coughs> we do find in Islam or Christianity or Hinduism or other denominations of the world. This is the number one. Number two is two is actually complement you for bringing to us uh, two nice slides of uh, the Mayutan School of Cartography, which uh, helped uh, the historian find out uh, so many stages of connectivity between East and West. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Mm -hmm. but all the really first appreciate question, the first one, the question. And the, the first one, uh, I, uh, I agree with you, because uh, uh, I, at the very first sight, uh, we think, oh, uh, uh, this, this kind of maps are naive, are ingenuous, they are very simple, uh, but um, the people in, in that uh, ages uh, doesn't travel it with, with, a, with a map in, in their hands as today. And um, they, they were representing, uh, especially uh, with, um, uh, Christian uh, maps, uh, the salvation of the soul, and uh, they must, uh, they needed uh, 
to know where uh, Jerusalem is, or in Muslim maps, where La, uh, is a place in La Mecca. And in Orient, places in the East is paradise in Christian Christian maps. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an, a, a kind of aid to, uh, for for uh, think uh, about salvation because um, they they are no uh, no um, no thinking about uh, longitude, latitude, and things like that. Um, they are thinking uh, the, the, the life in this in this earth is is um, ephemeral, 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 but uh, in the other world is eternal. Um, I have I have three speakers now on the list. You for you're the first, but you for time reasons I would close the speakers list if there isn't someone objecting. No, so we take the three speakers. Yes, please. Well, mine's a, a comment. In very simple question. First of all, um, I'm very grateful to you for you for pointing out this map or the, the wall of George and Van George in um, on the Greasy's map. <coughs> I think there is a, a, a narrative that goes there because we see it that book that will be repeated later in the, in the medieval narrative that we're showing up. And then I um, uh, and also another comment. I do what you exactly what you do with class I show them I show my students this map first and then Upside down, you can see where Europe is. And that leads to my question. I know I, I did know about um, Arab cartographers placing the south at the top of the map, as we see here. But what I didn't know, and perhaps you can answer this for me, is that Europeans tended to do that for several centuries after, say, the expulsion of Muslims from Spain from Europe, if you will. If you will. So, how long was it that Europeans tended to represent? In the medieval times, in Occident, uh, coexist uh, uh, every kind of maps, and we have oriented maps as well as uh, south on top map, and uh, we 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 have the the Kramauro, uh, example, and is the uh, is from the fifteenth uh, century. It's, it's in, uh, at the gates of the Renaissance, so this 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 wonderful map. Uh, and in this map, uh, there is no place for uh, fabulous races, monsters, uh, anything. It, it, it's only geography and and the, the different kind of ship, ships uh, navigating in the in the in the sea, also. And it, it is very, very curious because uh, it's the first uh, map that represents uh, the paradise uh, in, in another place, but out of this, uh, of this world. <coughs> and it's from the 15th century. Yes, please, gentlemen over there. I'm just, I'm just curious because at least, of course, produced, he's a Muslim producing his, his, the, the, his maps for a Christian king, and yeah. how how that, did that work? I mean, any consideration of you know Christianity versus Islam, you know, Mecca versus Jerusalem, and all that. Um, because, um, uh, for example, in 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 Spain, in Spain, um, um, during uh, several times in the Middle Ages, uh, the three cultures. Um, uh, Hebraic, Muslims, and uh, Christians uh, coexist uh, um, in peace, uh, and kings as uh, uh, Alfonso uh, the Tenth, uh, also called it the Wise, um, um, uh, he founded uh, the translation uh, school uh, in Toledo, uh, and and. We know uh, the, 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 the the Arabian uh, works from uh, scientific cartographers and <coughs> so on. Uh, because of this, as well as um, um, place like uh, chess, um, music, 
and many other works from uh, Muslim civilization in Spain. Final question, Christian. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the ancient times that Hawla was in Mariana, and there you can see that there's constant development. So to current theory, it's quite debated, but I really believe in it. Uh, there is a first map in the first century BC, and it goes up to the fourth uh, or fifth century AD, and this is all in one map. It's constantly, uh, constantly uh, being reworked, added, uh, uh, getting a new shape. Can you see any kind of development trends based on the time? And the second part, uh, do you see any cultural borders of belief? And uh, maybe a depiction of it. Where can you see Muslim? Where can you see Christians? And uh, how do they depict borders if they are if they are depicted? Yeah. Um, would you uh, repeat the, the ah the Kabula uh, Peltinger? Yeah. Um, it is very very pertinent and interesting your your question because uh, for example. Uh, the uh, Alibis map is very, very similar to Tabula uh, Peltingeriana. But uh, uh, is, uh, uh, the Tabula uh, uh, Peltinger uh, um, it was, uh, it was discovered in the medieval times, but it was uh, uh, a Roman uh, map. Uh, and um, it was uh, uh, almost uh, destroyed, and uh, the, the Christian monks they um, copy uh, that map, and and I think um, scholars said that uh, they uh, incorporate um, more uh, geographical um, uh, knowings. Uh, but it, it is it's true that it's very similar to Alidris's maps, and maybe in, in uh, maybe there are. Uh, re they were re remains uh, for the Roman Empire that uh, were uh, destroyed with the time. I don't know. And the other one, uh, the other question is about boundaries and limits, no? Yeah. yeah. Belief. So on the Arabian, Arabic or Islamic maps, is there other boundaries where you will find the Christians, for instance, and how is it depicted, and the other way around on. Christian maps, you have shown us a depiction of Mecca mm -hmm. on a, a water map, but uh, is there any part of boundary described or depicted where it says up to here you can find Christians and then at this point you have to uh, deal with uh, non-Muslims, for instance, and uh, how is it depicted? Um, I think, for example, the, the, the sample of, of Gog and Magog uh, is the same for for uh, Muslims and Christians because um, um, the, the the Holy Bible talks about uh, about Gog, Gog and Magog and also the Quran and the Holy Test uh, they um, share the same legend. Um, for another questions, I think I don't know. Um, I can't I, I I can, I can in, in, in another sample of, yeah. of the, the, the same legend. I'll help you with my uh, function as a uh, moderator of this panel because time is up. Quite, oh, quite, we're quite sorry, over time. Sorry, sorry. Thanks. No, not. There were important questions, but thanks to you for standing all these questions and comments. And thanks to all speakers for their uh, wonderful presentations and, of course, the engaged discussions and uh, questions from the audience. So with this, I'm closing the panel and hand over the word to the organizers for an announcement of what's coming next. Thanks again. <laughs>